Welcome to Smart Art. On this program, we hold discussions with leading economists and social scientists from around the world. There are no rules about what topics are brought to the table. The outcome is always interesting. Joining us tonight from Worcester, Massachusetts is Ed O'Donnell. Mr. O'Donnell is an Associate Professor of History at Holy Cross College. He is also the author of a new book, Henry George and the Crisis of Inequality. And joining us from Los Alamitos, California, is Alexandra Lau, the Director of the Henry George Historical Research Center in Philadelphia. I'm Andrew Mazzoni, President of the Henry George School of Social Science, and this is Smart Talk. Well, welcome aboard, uh, Ed and Alex. Uh, we're going to talk about, a, of course, your book, Ed, uh, on Henry George. It's near and dear to our hearts. And uh, in reading the book, I was amazed at the granular detail of what Henry George was doing in New York City. Uh, Alexandra, of course, has written her PhD on the very topic. So Alexandra, I would throw it to you. Uh, uh, what did you find interesting in Ed's uh, bio? Because yours is in as detailed, your, your PhD thesis is not as granular in terms of the activities politically that, uh, that uh, Henry George engaged in. Sure. Well, first, let me just say um, thanks, Ed, for uh, allowing me to ask a few questions and join in on this interview. Um, I, I also found your book fascinating, and uh, it was a real treat, you know, having, um, you know, read your dissertation and really relied on it when I was writing my own. So this was just really great. Um, I actually thought we would just start with your overall, your, your main argument, which, if I read it correctly, is essentially that one of the reasons why Henry George was so widely popular, um, especially among the working class, was that he offered what you describe as sort of a radical redefinition of Republican citizenship that really appealed to workers in the Gilded Age. So maybe you could just start by really kind of parsing that out. Right. Well, I mean, it's a, the Gilded Age is a very contentious period and a period of extraordinary you know, political, social, economic change. And to, to a large degree, people were reacting. I mean, in the Gilded Age, roughly 1870 to 1900, there are 37,000 strikes. Uh, there are huge up, you know, social movements of farmers and of workers and uh, the explosion of slums and very disturbing kinds of trends. And a lot of people were saying, well, you know, our political culture, our Republican culture tells us that we just sort of let the market, let the system ride this out and everything will be great. And uh, Henry George came along, and, and I guess the other argument was that and we should be very, very wary about messing with our Republican institutions, making the government any larger than it is, and so forth. And as Henry George would say, that was great when everybody was a farmer, and the largest cities were, you know, 50,000 people, and factories were little itty-bitty things in small towns. But now in this new modern Gilded Age era, uh, we need to re-examine that. And it's not, as he says very eloquently, it's not enough that every man has the right to vote if he lives in grinding poverty and can't provide for his family and so on. So George begins, again, along with other people in this era, to argue that there's an economic component to citizenship, not just purely political. And that's really one of the key ideas that he gets across that gains traction with lots and lots of people. Great. Now, now do you actually find his his uh, his proposal, his program, you say it's very radical, and certainly there were people at the time who considered it quite radical, but um, I, I kind of wonder how radical was it really? I mean, he really is echoing a long tradition of activists who have said um, that every citizen deserves the um, right or the opportunity to work land, to, to live on a piece of land, because, you know, he still saw land as being the basis of, of economic you know, generation or progress. So what was it that was really radical? Is it just this inclusion of economic rights within this Republican tradition of citizenship? Or was it the actual program he was proposing? Or was it both? Well, it's, it's both. And it's also um, not necessarily the program, per se, the, the single tax. But one, one of the fundamental sort of broad arguments that he makes is that, and this is where he's different from previous egalitarian movements, you know, like the artisans in the 1830s and 1840s, uh, he says the only way that this is going to happen 
uh, and that we get back on the right track is if we invoke, we use state power. You know, tr political culture in American history in the days of the founding fathers that, that was based on a fear of power, particularly government power. So we need, everybody agreed, Jefferson and company agreed, keep the government small, that's gonna preserve liberty. And, and again, George says that made perfect sense. That was a brilliant idea in that era, but times change. And, you know, trying times require, uh, I think he says, radical adjustments. And in this case, he said the state, uh, broadly conceived, is our only hope. So the thing that was once conceived of as the great threat to liberty, state power, people like George and the Knights of Labor and other groups are making similar kinds of claims, say really the only hope that we have is that the state emerge, at least to some degree, as, a, as an arbiter between uh, rights of workers and rights of corporations and banks and so forth uh, to pursue their own happiness and to pursue their own fortunes. Ed, let me, let me interject here. Two, two questions which are you know, kind of subsidiary questions. Uh, first off, uh, there was a huge Irish uh, population in New York City, and he made a triumphant tour to Ireland uh, about that time where it was much clearer uh, how land taxation would work in Ireland, which was rural and agricultural. And you could cite examples and obvious problems that you couldn't do when you went back to a teeming New York and then had to try to uh, parse out what land rent would be. So that I'm arguing, I'm arguing based off reading uh, your work, that without the Irish trip and publicity, where you got such traction there, and coming back with that in effect, the sanction of, the, of, of Parnell and all the famous Irish revolutionaries, that he wouldn't have made so much traction in the United States. I think that that's really a key part of it, is that he's, you know, like a lot of people um, in American history, you know, timing is everything and you can't control it. And his book is published in 1879. And literally at that very moment, the Irish economy is collapsing and it's going to lead to uh, another boom of Irish nationalist sentiment. And so he saw Ireland as a great place to kind of uh, make the case that when a small number of people can monopolize, you know, the key resources, it's going to lead to extreme poverty uh, and a very unrepublican-like society. And so, yes, uh, he he captivates. It's kind of funny because he's he's not Irish, he's not Catholic. Um, in some ways, he sort of stands out as the kind of people you know Irish Catholic workers tended not to like. Um, mm. But he has a way of appealing to them. Um, he has a, a, a genuineness about him. They understand, come to understand him as a, a fellow worker, uh, even though his working days are pretty well behind him by the time he comes well known. But they know he was a member of a union, a typographical union. And uh, there's a certain kind of genuine quality that they, that they like about him. And they may not understand the single tax. They may not even like the single tax, but they like, as one person once put it, they, they are drawn to his diagnosis, not his prescription. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Along that line, before I go turn it back over to uh, Alexandra, uh, even today in this, in this country, nobody has a clear idea of what the Georgia's prescription would look like economically. You know, first of all, the GDP accounts or everything are not set up to really look at the, the, uh, uh, the outcomes of taxing land and nature exclusively and nothing else. There is no, there's estimates that 30% of the GDP might be rent of some sort, but no one has ever proved it and, and, and come close to making a statement that was persuasive. In fact, if you are asked mainstream economists, they'd go to the GNP accounts and say, oh, rent is only two or three percent of the GNP. How can we possibly build a civilization, a society on such a small number? Did anyone back then understand the tax implications of, of uh, doing what he advocated, having a, a, a tax the rent away? and use that for society. And if so, there was no government mechanism of any substance back then that could have handled such revenues. That being the case, what would, pe what would people find other than his own individual charisma to hook onto during, during the populist era? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the beauty of George's plan was that it was very simple. Um, and he also, in some ways, never quite fully explained how it would work. And we did often brush aside questions about, well, how practical is it? You know, we don't have an internal revenue service or anything like it. How would that work? And he would say, oh, you know, it, it's going to work. 
So there was a certain, like a lot of reformers who offer kind of a single bullet panacea, um, he had that kind of faith in it and didn't really want to be bothered uh, by the details. And again, I think a lot of people uh, were gravitated towards his, his dire diagnosis of what was going on in, uh, in, in American society, that we can't, this is an unsustainable track that we're on towards a European style, a Dickensian style society of aristocrats and haves and have nots. And whether that was arrested or changed by using his single tax or establishing the eight hour day or uh, taxing by some mechanism, corporations or regulating them somehow, uh, people began to gravitate towards those solutions as viable solutions. So again, I, it's never clear and it's always hard to, to tell what, you know, how much an idea has impact. Well, in the end, in the end, and I'll say the end, in the early 1900s, Apparently, uh, the, the reformers got the notion that if you couldn't uh, actually implement a single tax on land, you could implement an income tax, and that by indirection, the people who are making the largest rents would perforce be those people with the highest incomes, and if you tax that directly, you in effect could get a Georgia solution without actually having to tamper with the notion of private property. Any comments on that? Yeah, and I think, I think that's true. And it also recognized the fact that fewer and fewer people's fortunes were in property, you know, property as we understood it, landed estates. It was understanding that this is, you know, money and value and income and wealth uh, were becoming different things in the late 19th, and early 20th century. So income taxes seemed to many people to be that kind of rational uh, solution to come up with a progressive tax that could address some of these problems and also get us away from uh, reliance on tariffs. Hey, Alexandra, any comments? Well, yeah, actually, I'll speak to this now. Um, you know, the income tax bill really did divide the Georgist movement because there were a number of single taxers who actually supported it in Congress. The reason Georgists um, and single taxers supported the progressive income tax is, is in part because it would reach some of that wealth that was generated from land but also because it was passed in conjunction with the reduction of the tariff. And remember, lots of single taxers, including Henry George, were adamantly um, opposed to the tariff. And so I think that's one of the reasons why they supported a progressive income tax. Um, but one of the things I was hoping, you know, Professor O'Donnell, you could clarify just a tiny bit in terms of the um, what George, in your mind, what did he mean by the state? Because I was never really able to pinpoint what George envisioned by the state? Well, uh, George is, uh, like a lot of people, a complex figure, and he uh, always professed that he was a, a true Jeffersonian, that he actually believed in small, small government, but at the same time, he proposed a, a reform that even though he never articulated exactly how it would work, he essentially you know, said that the state um, would impose a tax and collect that tax and then use that tax uh, revenue for the common good. So he's... He never gets into the, the details, partly, I think, because he knows that that's very dangerous territory. I mean, there's a booming socialist movement uh, in the late 19th century, and he wants to make sure, again, he kind of walks a tightrope with that issue. He says he's not a socialist, that there's sort of two extremes in our ideology uh, in, the, in the Gilded Age. One is laissez-faire, you know, the idea of no government, no restraints, in a, a libertarian uh, world. Uh, that that many people advocate, and then on the other extreme, he saw socialism, um, or what he would specifically call revolutionary socialism, because he actually kind of liked socialism. He just said socialism phased in, uh, you know, over 50, 100, 200 years. Um, so he knew that he had to be careful when talking about anything involving the state, because it immediately opened one up to accusations of being a socialist, and he was. Um, for most of his public career in the 1880s, that didn't really bother him so much. But um, after things get really dicey in the late 1880s, after the Haymarket bombing and the kind of big, really what it arguably was America's first red scare, uh, he begins to distance himself somewhat strategically from that notion of anything smacking of socialism and increased state power. Right. But you also get the sense from Henry George that he didn't actually think the single tax would have increased the power of the state, so to speak. I mean, he wanted to utilize the existing machinery of state government. 
Well, he one thing he did argue was that um, even if the say the single tax did necessitate a certain amount of uh, state power, that over the long haul the impact of the of the single tax would be to uh, reduce and eliminate all kinds of state functions. So, for example, he says uh, because we'd be a more equitable, peaceful society, we wouldn't spend nearly as much on uh, criminal justice and on the court system uh, because. Uh, everybody was healthy. We wouldn't spend so much uh, money on on health care. Um, and a whole wide range of, of government functions, he said, would simply just become irrelevant. So he does have an eye towards, at least he acknowledges, maybe there'll be a little increase in state authority, but in the aggregate, probably less as this, as this kind of utopian idea uh, plays out to this kind of perfect Christian utopia that he describes towards the end of his book. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll interject a, qu a question. Uh, if he had become mayor of New York City, if, if you had to speculate, what would he have done? What could he have done institutionally? Yeah, well, it, it's hard to imagine he wouldn't have been able to do much uh, in practical terms. I mean, there are a lot, as I lay out in the book, the, the first thing that would have had to happen was that they would have had to change the state constitution because at that time, New York City had very little autonomy. It was mostly directed, you know, their taxing, their policing, their fire. Well, all of that, those key functions were controlled by the state government. So for George to have any kind of real impact as, as mayor, he'd have to uh, kind of lead a movement in the, in the state constitutional convention to change that. So that's a really, the odds were pretty slim against something like that happening in the days of Tammany Hall. So in all likelihood, he probably would have been a one-term mayor um, and probably wouldn't, would have been frustrated in most of his endeavors but he may have uh, been able to call to uh, attention to certain kinds of uh, questions and certain kinds of reforms in a way that he was unable to do out of office. You know, he's, he's against the tariff, he's a free trader, and he's not understanding for sure uh, that Ricardian uh, free trade certainly can't be practiced today, probably in his time, but he's also a guy, he's, he's, he's against tariff for free trade, and he wants a single tax. How did he envision the trade-off in revenues, or did he? Uh, because essentially he was going to kill the revenues of one for the uncertain revenues of another, which he's never, he never articulated and never quantified, where the tariff was a, was a well-known quantity of money coming into the country and used to fund the, fund the U.S. government. Yeah, I mean, he, again, he doesn't, I think in some ways, out of self-preservation, he doesn't articulate, and maybe just the limits of his own economic training. I mean, he was a self-taught, Economist, it's, it's pretty extraordinary. A guy with a you know sixth, seventh grade education who's able to, you know, master the great minds of you know Ricardo and Smith and so forth. If you read the last chapters of Progress and Poverty, he's saying really laying out a utopian future where there's plenty of uh, leisure time. Everybody has decent housing. There are public parks, places of recreation, excellent public schools, and so forth. So uh, in his mind, there's he doesn't get into the details, but in his mind, the single tax is absolutely going to provide a huge treasury of revenue to uh, provide you know, a, a wonderful life for everyone. Alexandra? Yeah, absolutely. I think he saw a reduction in the tariff. Um, the, the, the taxation on land values would, would uh, make up more than make up for that revenue. I mean, he really believed that you could operate all of the functions of government from the single tax on land values, and maybe at that time you could depending, you know, the functions of the government want, aren't what they were um, today. Um, and, and Professor O'Donnell, you do mention towards the end of your book that George's, the, you know, his failed mayoral campaign isn't really the end of his legacy. And that you do see some, um, somewhere where that George is helping to inform the, um, inform progressivism or what becomes known as progressivism. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, the list of people from, you know, the 1890s on who, are sort of who's who of progressivism, um, very, very, a great many of them um, say in their early, you know, in their memoirs or in their letters or in their autobiographies uh, that a key moment for them in their, their blossoming as a progressive was reading Progress and Poverty or something written by, uh, by George. And I think that the general, again, they weren't, some were enamored with the single tax, but most were enamored with this idea that uh, the the state, and this is a transatlantic phenomenon, this is happening in Great Britain and many other places as well, basically in all industrialized societies, uh, there's this great kind of uh, ideological shift towards saying the state does have the power and the obligation 
to use its levers of its, its powers to boost the common good. And Alexander, the, uh, I think he engaged in a debate in England. I don't know if you cover this with a, with a famous socialist. And, and essentially, my reading of that debate is that Hinman bested George in, in, in that debate uh, because Hinman would simply say to George, yes, uh, the land tax is, a, is an obvious tax, but there's more to it. There are other forms of monopoly growing up in an industrial society. Uh, you know, whether it's corporations, where it's franchises, where it's government uh, grants, there are many spots of, of, uh, of a monopoly and that you simply don't get it with the, with the single uh, land tax. And I don't think George ever could broaden his position. And he, he couldn't debate that effectively. And I think that took a lot of steam out of his, uh, his allure for socialists, for sure. Uh, any comments on, on that debate? Yeah, I mean, I think most socialists saw George as uh, someone helping the cause, you know, whether it's Karl Marx or, uh, or, or some of the other leading European socialists. They, they liked, at least early on, that he was, his, some of his ideas are gaining traction, but they were concerned that because it was kind of a, um, a wonderful silver bullet panacea, that it might take people's eyes off the real, the larger set of uh, social problems, that it wasn't just a problem of, of land taxes. And so I think that that had a, um, in, ultimately by 1886, 1887, they're beginning to see, reject George. And then at that very moment, he starts to reject them too. So, uh, and George finds it immensely frustrating to try to engage in those. He wants to engage in those debates. He wants to be seen as a, as a heavy hitting, um, you know, international uh, intellectual. Uh, but he has a hard time. He's not a, he's a good speaker, but he's not a great speaker. And he's certainly not a great debater. Um, and he has frustration with when when pressed for some of these uh, specifics. Yes, I, I, and I, it seems to me that the steam starts to go out of the Georgist movement uh, after that debate, which was well known. It became a very famous debate around the mm -hmm. world. Would you agree or disagree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think it does. I mean, and George himself, it's kind of a strange story. After you know, the by the eighteen nineties. There's this single tax movement that's gaining a lot of membership. It's you know becoming a national organization with chapters all over the country, and it's really the baby of Henry George. He's wrote the book that gave rise to that phrase and to that concept. And by 1892, 93, he's he's no longer going to the conventions. He's really kind of separating himself, uh, kind of disillusioned or or disaffected with the, with that movement. So it's a um, he's. He's sort of adrift in some ways after after um, 1889, 1890, trying to find his his way really and really to a large degree, you could argue he's shifting his attention towards free trade, which in some ways is a lot less controversial uh, than the single tax, which could always be labeled radical and socialist. Alexandra, yeah, I would agree with that. I think um, just to go back to the the the, so the debate with this famous socialist. Um, yeah, I mean, George, at first he's labeled as a socialist, um, and then it becomes very clear he's not. And that's when you, he, you actually start to see him become a little bit more conservative to some degree, right? You know, Karl Marx refers to him as his ideas as, the, as capitalism's last ditch. And it's true. I mean, George had no um, notions of overturning capitalism. He really just wanted to reform it. Um, and then once the progressive era gets going... One of the other things that I think you, you sort of see George being on the other side of the of the progressive shift is he continues to to ground his philosophy in this idea that there are these immutable natural laws, um, you know, really natural rights philosophy. And the progressives in large degree sort of reject that kind of thinking and moved much more towards pragmatism. So that's the other where the other place where I think George, the individual, gets sort of left out. But I think by the 1890s, he is he starts to become OK with this idea that others are going to carry on his legacy. And I think you actually do see a softening in his his uh, insistence on the single tax the way he envisioned it. And I think you see that because he does start supporting other individuals who are running for local office, public office, invoking his ideas, but really adapting them to fit their own um um, the, the things that they want to address. And in particular, I'm thinking of the mayors, the progressive mayors like Tom Johnson here. Um, 
So that, that's how I, I do think by the 1890s, uh, Ed is correct. He starts to, the individual, George as the individual, I would say, starts to fade. Ed, how, how uh, influential in the overall analysis of American uh, social reformers would you rate George in, in terms of his impact, his longevity? I know it's a tough one to do. Uh, we use George's, of course, uh, hold to uh, his main idea of uh, taxing monopoly, although um, I myself call myself a neo-Georgist, and I look for monopolies wherever they, they appear, so we generalize it. But from your perspective as a historian, I mean, is there any other social reformers of his time, let's say between 1850 and 1900, that have a similar impact and, and in effect uh, deflected some of what he had uh, to say? Well, I, I'd be, I would say he's certainly one of the most influential, um, again, partly because of his timing. You know, he writes his book in 1879. Um, he also gains an enormous amount of it, gets a lot of attention. And he appeals both to working class people and increasingly to a large middle class uh, set of Americans. So uh, he's one of the first people to really stand up in the, in, in, in the Gilded Age and to say, we are going off the rails here. If we continue with this extreme, this widening gap of rich and poor, haves and have nots, we are going to be resembling the very thing we broke away from, which is a European style society of uh, fixed classes and aristocrats and, and serfs and so forth. And so he's really the, the, the first person to, to make this claim and, and have people really pay attention to it. So um, how you measure that impact is, is difficult to say. People could, would make, I think other historians might say, well, Henry George was important, but how, more, how much more important he was than, say, Terence Powderly, who was the head of the Knights of Labor, you know, might make for an interesting argument about um, in terms of broader impact and, and the, some of the ideas they got across. But he's part of, a, of an emerging movement that not only in the United States, uh, but also internationally across the, uh, the Atlantic, uh, of people in some ways asking the same questions and proposing similar solutions. So the best, the, the most I'll say is he's certainly one of the most influential people in the Gilded Age, and his influence lasts well, he dies in 1897, his influence lasts well beyond uh, his death. Uh, really, for several generations beyond. And the obvious question: Why did you get interested in Henry George? And then Alexandra, you can close the close the the, uh, the talk. Why did you, Ed, get interested? I, I've, yeah, I've always when I, when I sat down to try to figure out what my doctoral thesis would be on, I I knew I liked reform movements. I knew I was interested in taxes, just for whatever reason. And uh, I was also increasingly by then I'd been in New York City for three years and really kind of become an interest in urban history, the history of New York City, and those three things kind of came together uh, in Henry George, and I think someone must have mentioned him to me when I, when I laid out those things. Somebody must have said, have you ever taken a look at Henry George? And from there, I decided that was the, that was the topic. Well, he does, this, he does survive in the mainstream uh, uh, world with the Henry George theorem, and, uh, which is a mathematical theorem about covering the, the social costs of an urban area. So, you know, he's stuck in as uh, respectable in certain circles, and I think uh, even someone like Stiglitz would, would, would give a strong nod to taxing inelastic factors of production uh, today. So he, his influence still is an undercurrent. Alexandra, your final comments on, on the book, uh -huh. Henry George? Well, actually, I was going to kind of my final comment was going to be somewhat of a of a return to something in uh, Professor O'Donnell's book. He says towards the end of his his introduction that um, there's a sort of terrible relevance of George's ideas um, right now. And, you know, and of course, like any good historian, you 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 have a bit of a hesitant, hesi you know, you hesitate to really compare the past to the present. Um, but I'm wondering, are there some lessons that we can take away from the crisis of inequality in the Gilded Age to, that might really help us today sort of navigate um, the, the sort of economic times in which we live? And then I also wonder, to go back to your, your argument about this idea of labor attaching itself to a notion of Republican citizenship, has that happened or is that starting to happen now? Well, in, in terms of the first question, when I look and, you know, as I often say, unfortunately, Henry George is really relevant now. You know, uh, 
it'd be better. Uh, much, much, I think we'd all prefer to live in a society that was less uh, factionalized, less you know, stressed out economically and, and facing big questions about inequality. But the, there's, sort of, there's a lot of things about Henry George, I think, that apply to today. But one is this, um, this emphasis on the common good, uh, which I think is to a large degree, I wouldn't say a lost value, but a, a value that has been suppressed and dismissed for a long, long time. And increasingly, we start to hear, whether it's labor unions or social reformers and others, uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement, whatever, you, various people arguing that we need to attend to individualism is great. Individualism is, in fact, one of the things that has made the United States distinct and a great society and a productive society, but it's not the only thing. I mean, he uses phrases like industrial slavery because he says that's where these, these trends are heading if we don't attend to it. So I think... That emphasis on the reviving the common good would do a lot for our society today, and also reviving a notion that there is an economic dimension of uh, Republican citizenship that also needs to be uh, attended to. How we attend to those things, how we deal, bring, you know, uh, achieve those things, that's the, the stuff of political and uh, debate. But we need to, I think we're, we're even not even in the debate yet. We need to come up, argue, make, put those two ideas forward. Alexandra, any? Absolutely, and I, you know, one of the this, this sort of ironic uh, places or the ironic, you know, figures who I think is actually sort of um, touching upon a lot of Henry George's ideas is Pope Francis, and I think he has a lot to say that Henry George would actually agree with. And so I'm actually watching um, watching this Pope with a lot of excitement and in a lot of uh, deja vu to some degree. And uh, so I think that's one place that we can sort of see a resurgence in at least the rhetoric. That Georgian used because um, it is so he, he he you know his rhetoric was so infused with Christian um, idealism and Christian values. Yeah, yep, and uh, and I think that that's how you know we don't we can't predict the future. But if we were to say, are we on the cusp of a similar kind of shift back towards reform as it happened in the late nineteenth century, entering the Progressive Era? Okay, I think we we can uh, we can end the uh, the discussions for the day. Ed and Alexandra, thanks for uh, shedding light on our, our favorite subject, uh, Henry George. And uh, good luck on the book sales, uh, Ed. All right. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> and that's it for this edition of Smart Talk. In upcoming shows, we will be talking to such renowned economists as Dr. James Galbraith. Dr. Galbraith is a professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. His most recent book is Inequality and Instability, a study of the world economy just before the great crisis. Please post your questions or comments on our website at henrygeorgeschool.org. I'm Andrew Mazzoni. We will see you again next time.